Welcome back to OWASP Top 10 Explained and in this series we are looking at the top 10 most serious web vulnerabilities according to OWASP and their 2013 list. There is a new list coming out soon I think in the next month or two and A5 is an interesting one because really it's kind of a big catch catch-all sort of issue which relates to lots of different things that they cover under the title security misconfiguration so what are we talking about here well in some ways this is a very general issue so there's not particularly any code that we can look at uh, particularly to help us with this but it's a general note that we need to consider the configuration for a whole raft of systems that create what we call our web server or our web application. So we're talking about the application itself with everything that supports that. We're talking about the servers that it runs on, virtual servers, physical servers, the web server, the software web server, talking about firewalls, talking about databases, and making sure that we use best practice across all of those and that all settings are considered and checked. So we're looking at things here like a default pages or accounts. So if you install WordPress, for instance, you will find that certainly on older versions that there was always an admin account. And when you install WordPress, you gave it a password. But guess what? If an attacker already knows that your username is admin, they can assume that a lot of people are going to choose a rubbish password and then they're automatically cracking WordPress sites all around the world. So, for instance, one good security control is to change the default account and call it something else, not admin. And I think in the new versions of WordPress, it does that. It asks you for the username and the password, which is great. And similarly, default pages, you'll find a lot of people automating searches for things like wp-login, which is a default WordPress page, uh, and other pages like that. Clearly, the more obvious these targets are to an attacker, then the easier it is for them to create tools to try and attack and abuse these things. So things like unused pages, which again, if they're not used, why are they there? Why don't you delete them? Why don't you hide them? Whatever, you know, what you do is up to you. The point is these are the sorts of things that you need to consider. Or how many people are still running old versions of Windows that have things like Net NetBIOS ports open or FTP open? All these kinds of things that give the attacker more doors to try and break into when they're trying to attack your web application. Even if you need FTP, a better way, for instance, would be to put FTP on a different server and have that different server either tunnel directly or have some other mechanism to send the files across to your actual web server because it's much harder for an attacker then to know that that is your FTP port if it's running on a completely different server. Uh, data leakage is actually covered in A6, which is the next um, the next one after this. However, it's also a security configuration issue. Have you ever checked what happens if you have a page not found, a 404? Have you tried to make your application crash in some way and make sure that, uh, first of all, it doesn't show the user any internal information, which might give the, uh, the, the attacker clues as to what software you're running, what your directory layout is, what framework you're using, what the names of database tables are, or, you know, even it's possible to leak usernames and passwords if your code dumps a whole call stack to the user when it crashes. So again, the things that we need to look at. Another one, another kind of area that perhaps developers don't automatically think about Whereas people like DevOps and IT managers kind of think of these things, or hopefully they think of them, is the actual systems themselves, the software. Are you patching your software? Are you updating your operating system? Are you installing critical updates? Are you updating virus checkers? Whatever it is you've got there, it's not enough for it to work when you first deploy it. It has to be maintained over time. And then another classic misconfiguration is having files and directories which are not designed to be accessed directly by a user, 
but because of misconfiguration, then they are accessible. And an example of this is a file like web.config, which is used in .NET to configure a web application. And because it is an important file and because it is likely to contain a lot of secret information, then IIS will automatically block a request for web.config because it never needs to be sent back to the person accessing the site. But again, have you checked on your web application that your files and directories, your log files, perhaps that's um, a rich minefield for an attacker. Have you checked what happens if somebody tries to access uh, the log file which might live under your web root and just because they don't have a direct link to it doesn't mean they're not going to be able to guess what the log file uh, location is and just imagine for instance uh, one day one of your developers or one of your system guys makes a mistake and your application is vulnerable for a short period of time so maybe that's long enough for somebody to learn a lot of information about your web application that they wouldn't normally be able to find out and if you then don't take any actions then everything they learn might still be true even after you fix it so once that information is exposed it can become valuable and you know these are all the sorts of things that come under the umbrella of security misconfiguration. Now this is just a simple diagram that I threw together. There are more things that could go on here. Uh, I haven't put a firewall on there. Things like load balancers, all those kinds of things are all kind of in scope. But what we forget as developers sometimes is it's not just about our framework, our application running on top of a framework. It's about libraries that we pull in. And that could be code, it could be a binary library. It doesn't really matter. Do we actually know that those other libraries are secure or are they just happen to be very helpful and we've installed them just for that reason alone? Even the web server software itself might have its own libraries. You tend to actually have a gateway and the gateway calls an actual web server object to actually process the pages. So maybe Apache is OK, but what about, um, you know, lib, lib PHP or, you know, PHP FPM or whatever it is that you happen to be using? All of these are separate entities and all of them have a risk that they will have vulnerabilities in them either long term vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities because they're old and you need to update them or vulnerabilities that appear every now and then and maybe they're in the version you're using maybe they're not and nowadays TLS used to be called SSL but let's get away from that now TLS settings it's a, it's a big deal nowadays because if you're using uh, SSL versions 1 2 and 3 then your site is considered insecure if you're using things like RC4 uh, as, as a valid cipher then again you're considered insecure because you open up yourself to things like downgrade attacks if you don't configure your TLS properly so somebody is trying to connect to your site using a strong cipher but it, because you support a weak one then a man in the middle can pretend to be using strong encryption to the browser and then be using weak encryption to your server and then have much more chance of being able to decrypt traffic so again it's just another thing there are tools out there so you've got things like ssl labs by callus is a fantastic resource it's free you can point it at your your server assuming it's publicly visible and it will tell you what you're doing right and wrong so the things do exist but this is just to show you there is a landscape there and it's an important landscape uh, what about the database? Are you updating the database? Maybe the database lives on another server. If it does, is the other server secure? Have you configured the firewall correctly? Is it possible for somebody to get into, say, the DMZ or DMZ, if you're American, onto your web server and then bunny hop across a, a poorly configured firewall onto a database server which might be running on your local area network. So all these kinds of things, you know, they are important and any one of them can often uh, cause you embarrassment at minimum, denial of service perhaps, and at worst, a full-on data breach which none of us want to see. So how common is it? Obviously, 
it's very common because there are a hundred different things to consider. But part of the difficulty of security misconfiguration is very hard to measure. There's no way you can put a number on how secure your system is. So you could say that I've spent a lot of time making my Apache installation secure, but how do I measure that? And how does that change over time? Maybe a new vulnerability appears. Um, you know, so things change as well over time and it can be quite hard to keep track of. It's also fair to say that not all outcomes, not all misconfigurations are as serious as others. So I've already talked about TLS configuration. So when people connect with HTTPS, if you, let's say you have SSL3 enabled, okay, that's not considered the best idea, but that's not a serious as um, you know, having a, a really, really old version of PHP or Apache that hasn't been updated for five years or whatever. So not everything is as serious as everything else, but it's not always easy to know um, how serious the things are. It's also common because sadly, and this is still the case, most web servers and most frameworks do not have a completely secure configuration by default. Um, and they don't make it easy. I mean, you look at Apache, you try and configure Apache uh, to be secure and it takes a lot of work. You're editing text files. It's all a bit nasty and you've got to kind of read into stuff. And then especially when it doesn't work properly, you're then scratching your head, searching around. And of course, one of the worst things you can do is copy and paste somebody's answer from the web without really understanding what you're doing. But of course, that's what most of us do if we don't have the expertise. So we've got all these kind of insecure frameworks and web servers, which makes it harder. Um, debugging settings should be removed in production code. They're called debugging for a reason. They're supposed to be just for debugging. Uh, but again, they're not always removed in production code. And especially if you have no reason to remove it and you forget, then uh, that, again, you risk exposing data, exposing information to an attacker. Um, and yeah, I guess kind of maybe the bottom line one is the configurations can be very complex. So another example, if you look at Windows Firewall, it's like most firewalls, it's the, or the advanced one anyway, it's very powerful. It can do lots of different things, but even the default settings have, have about... 20 or 30 ports open with different parameters. And again, understanding which of those you need to have open and which of them are just open to try and be helpful for when you're running your computer and network is not always very obvious. And you know, if you close down the ports, maybe things look like they're working, but maybe uh, your time is going to stop working or your FTP is going to stop working or, or something else. So it can be quite hard to get those figuration, uh, configurations right, and that's why uh, that's what makes this thing quite common. So how do we fix it? Well, as you might imagine, there's kind of lots of different things that we need to do. And I think one of the things we need to do as developers, as software engineers, is to have a much, much bigger picture view of what it is that we're doing. So we shouldn't think of software development as a case of throwing some code together, making something do what we want it to do, and then thinking that's the end of it. We need to think more like a doctor. So a doctor's job, let's say, performing surgery on someone's arm, isn't just to fix the person's arm. It's about anesthetic. It's about preparing for surgery. It's about recovery time. It's about making sure that the patient is okay afterwards, about um, having a an appointment for a, a month's time to check everything's okay. There's a whole range of things that need to be present in order for that surgery to be successful. And as developers as, and as security conscious developers, we need to think bigger picture. So the first thing I've got here is we need to learn about multiple technologies. If we can't do that, then we need to consider very seriously consider paying expert people to do some of this work for us. So if we're a small team, we won't know about everything. But why not? Why not um, get one person to be your Apache expert and one person to be your secure PHP expert, whatever it might be. Let's think of it in terms of making sure that somewhere in our team we have relevant expertise. And do you know what? That might cost us money. We might have to go on a course and it might cost $500 or $1,000. But for most of us, can we really afford just to be slapdash 
and hope that you know no one's going to attack our site because hopefully the news over the past five years or so has shown us that everybody is a target for attack and uh, not just the obvious people like banks and stuff um, there are plenty of books about secure web server setup uh, what I'd say here is be very careful about where you get your information from so okay a book has a certain amount of credibility uh, read the reviews on it find out who's written it those kinds of things be careful about stuff that you find on forums and stack overflow and all the rest of it because I don't know about you but I've read comments where somebody says this is the best way to do X and then the very next comment says that is the worst way to do it so clearly some of these things don't have very obvious answers or if they do have obvious answers we don't always know when we read those things who it is who knows the right answer and who it is who just thinks they know the right answer so we've got to be a bit careful but there are plenty of books about that one thing that you'll hear me talk about probably in every single one of these top 10 items is code review and deployment checklists it's the easiest thing in the world and it's the most basic repeatable and self-improving quality control and what does it look like it literally is a bullet point list of things to check before you deploy but it might also be um, you might have a, um, a an update plan which you run every month and you might go through it again bullet point list have you checked that server have you checked that server have you checked Apache have you checked the dotnet framework have you checked Windows updates whatever it might be you know code review and deployment checklists have you disabled debugging uh, 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 yes have you made sure that you are using the right TLS configuration have you run the Kalis SSL server test against your site tick 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 really really easy and the good thing is you can update the checklist every time you make a mistake so you might do something one time and think ah you know I've made this mistake I'm gonna add it to my checklist so next time I, I will never make this mistake again but the other thing that's quite cool about a checklist is you can add something to it even if you don't get as far as actually making the mistake so maybe you spot something and you think ah I need to be careful that I don't do that in a, in a real deployment add it to the checklist it, it honestly doesn't add much time to your to your job and what it means is you're deploying high quality software you want people to like your software you want your boss to like it you want your customers to like it and if your customers like it they're going to buy more of it you're going to have more money um, and your company's going to do well so these are all good things all positive things um, automate things where possible now there's a little bit of a, a balance here because sometimes the automation can be more complicated than doing things manually but uh, for instance in .NET you have this idea of web.config transforms so for every deployment target you can have a, a different flavor of web config that takes the original one and then you can just change a few things in it so you can have things like debug can be disabled for your release build or you can point to a different database connection string for different configurations so by automating simple things like that especially things that don't change every you know 10 minutes then it's almost like a kind of a fit and forget sort of uh, approach and it just again it removes those manual steps that we do that is usually where we make mistakes one of the things that's really hard I find it really hard is trying to keep um, paying attention to security announcements to vulnerabilities to hacker news to the register whatever it is you know those kind of sites who you know put the things up straight away saying open SSL has a vulnerability or Apache has a vulnerability or dotnet has a vulnerability whatever it is so that you get to see it really early on and you get to actually take action on it before somebody has the chance to get round to your site and attack it using the vulnerability most of the time the vulnerabilities are not you know not really 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 serious the really serious ones tend to get spotted quite quickly um, but it still pays attention to um, sorry pays uh, dividends to 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 keep an eye on these things as they're happening and then the last one is you know having an update plan to make sure that patches and all the rest of it are applied at suitable times so if you think about it imagine that I don't know you've got a load of Windows updates to apply to your web server when are you gonna do that 
because some people are kind of thinking, well, my website's working, and if it's an important web application, let's say you work for a bank or something, in some ways you don't want to risk installing Windows updates on a system that's working. But then when you're going to apply them, if you don't apply them to a working site, you know, have you got a way to do that? Have you got a test system that you can have a copy of the live site? You can install all the Windows updates. You can run a load of tests to make sure it basically works. Are you going to do that? Or maybe the next time you make an update uh, of code, you also um, add all the Windows updates at the same time and you test everything together. Maybe that's a better way to do it. But whatever it is, you know, have an update plan to make sure that you don't have these servers like I do that sit around for months and months and months, sometimes getting very little use and which are very easy to forget about. I mean, it, just in the small company that I work for, we've probably got maybe 20 virtual machines and, you know, some of them Windows, some of them Linux. Uh, and I need to make sure that I'm on top of the updates so that every time I'm logging in, I'm saying, right, let's install them all now, reboot it and, you know, forget about it till next month. So these are just kind of general things. But I guess going back to this kind of page, once we have the blue sky thinking and once we have the idea of um, checklists and of these sorts of things, start get understanding what it is to have repeatable self-improving processes we do whatever works for you it, you know use one note use wikipedia it doesn't matter what you use use something that you can improve over time so that theoretically your code your deployment your quality will always increase um, and then hopefully half of these things uh, that we talked about in terms of the vulnerabilities here um, won't be happening to you so there's lots more could be said about it, but I think I've probably said enough now. So as per usual, any questions or comments, please add them below. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.